right or one, two, one, two. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in its history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories. The plain, unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names have, for obvious reasons, been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is provided by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. And now you are to hear the voice of Chief Superintendent John Davidson, who is in charge of Scotland Yard's famous Black Museum. Good afternoon. This device is not in the strictest sense a murder weapon. You don't recognize it? Listen, you undoubtedly will. A little out of tune, I'm afraid. It's been here a long time. Eh? A clarinet. You see? It's used in dance bands, I'm told. The man who owned this played in a dance band many years ago. And a certain young woman who listened to him died. No, I hasten to say, as not as a result of listening. No, a knife was used. This knife. And a man was hanged. Would you like to hear more about it? I lost Inspector Frank Bennett. I was preparing to unlock my desk and begin the day's work on the morning of Monday, the 1st of May, 1936. When the door to my office opened suddenly, and I was confronted by a tall, initiated young man in a blue serge suit and a shock of remarkably rumpled blonde hair. I looked up in pardonable surprise as he spoke. They said there was somebody in here. They must be right. I am here. Are you an inspector or something? Merely an inspector. My name is w Woods. Good morning, Mr. Woods. Slinger Woods. Good morning, Slinger. That's what they call me in the Navy. Everyone named Woods is called Slinger in the Navy. Were you in the Navy? I read it in a book. Huh? His Majesty's Navy, published two years ago, paper covers, sixpence. Oh. And what can I do for you, Matlow? Who? Matlow, term for a British sailor, from the French Matlow, page 29, same book. Oh. In other words, what do you want, sir? Oh, I came to tell you I found my clarinet. Well, should we care? Shouldn't you Scotland Yard care? You better care. I should say you jolly well better care, copper. It's a little early in the day to make funny jokes with the police, mister. This isn't a joke, sir. I don't think it is either. If you're listening... I'm listening. Well, I left my clarinet at my lady friend's flat last night. You've been serenading her? No, I hadn't been serenading her. I had it with me when I took her home from work and I left it there. Yes. And when I got home, I didn't have it. Yes. I didn't even think about it last night when yes. I came in. But this morning, I remembered I'd had it at our flat and I hurried right round... And you'd been sitting up all night playing it. No. What? She, she's dead. <laughs> I returned my keys to my pocket, put my hat on, and followed Mr. Slingerwood's the bereft clarinet player out into Whitehall. Our noses pointed towards Stanhop Gate, which was roughly 15 minutes' walk away at the edge of the West Side Theatrical and Nightclub Belt. As we walked along, Woods added a few details. We both work at the Fitton Slipper. A shoe shop? Nightclub. I play clarinet and double on the ultra sax in Joe Di Donato's band. Oh? She sings. And she was a singer. Nice girl. Mm, the best. Sister plays piano. Same band? Joe's, yes. Girls live together? Her sister's married. Rowena lived alone. Rowena? Well, this girl is dead. You in love with her? Just good friend. Why'd you kill her? I didn't kill her. She was killed, though. She didn't just die, heart failure or something like that. There's a knife in her heart. Whose? I, I don't know. Better tell me about it, hadn't you? There's much to tell. I... Went around there first thing, as I said, looking for my clarinet. Early, no, nobody else up yet. Front door of the flat was open. Walked in, and her door was open. Looked in. What did you see? My clarinet on the table when I left it. Go on. And I saw her lying on the floor. Dressed? Oh, of course. She had on the same dress she was wearing when I brought her home. Lying on the floor, and when I put my head in the door, I, 
I saw the knife and the blood. Otherwise, I thought she was asleep. She was dead? Mm. You touch her? I should say not. How do you know she was dead? Well, I, I shouted at her and she didn't move. And, and, and the knife and the blood. Anybody know you'd been there? Uh, her sister knew. I took her home last night. This morning, no. Everybody was asleep, I expect. It was early, I said. Where's your clarinet? I left it there. I didn't touch it. Might be fingerprints on it. Oh, I see. Look here, you don't believe me, do you? Not very much. Well, I didn't do it. So you said. Well, I didn't. We'll see. That, uh, that's the house there where the front door's open. The houses in Stanhope Gate, which was once merely a gate through the ancient city wall of London, are all old. Everything in Stanhope Gate is old except the people, and many of them are members of some very ancient professions. Their places of employment are not far away. Places where one may dance or listen to music and singing, places where one may drink or on occasion eat or pursue any of a number of other occupations. Slinger Woods, the clarinetist, led me through the open door of a faintly creaking, faintly musty staircase to another open door. On the floor inside the door, in a remarkably neat little sitting room, I don't know what I'd expected, lay the body of a tiny red-haired girl in a very chic little black dress. There was blood staining the carpet and a plain, almost silver table knife protruding from her breast. She lay on her back and her mouth was open. A cigarette which had fallen from her mouth had scorched her chin. A Craven A packet was on a toll tray on the little home-painted green table alongside the clarinet. That was all. That's where I found her. Dead. That's what I told you. You don't seem very upset, Woods. Well, what shall I do? Burst into tears? You might. I hardly knew this kid, Inspector. And you said you had no reasons for killing her. I hadn't. We'll see. Why don't you find out who did kill her? When I do, he'll hang. I hope so. Do you? I do, most sincerely. Is there a telephone? Uh, right there. Uh, thank you. Put me through to Whitehall 1212. Who's that? Scotland Yard. I'd like to speak to the duty officer, CID, please. Thank you. Scotland Yard. Hello, who's speaking, please? Oh, hello, Nobby. Oh, Frank Bennett here. I'm at Stanhope Gate. Uh, what's his number, Woods? Hmm? Oh, a uh, 17. Uh, 17 Stanhope Gate, Nobby. I've run into a rather sticky one here, old boy. Murder. I'll need a police surgeon, a photographer. Is Tom McDermott there? Good, send him, Woods. And fingerprint people. The whole works, if you please. Right. Thank you at once. I'll be outside waiting for you. Yes, number 17, Stanhope Gate. Bye. I sincerely hope you'll be satisfied, Mr. Woods. Sling. I think I told you the dead girl's name was Rowena Hargett. Her sister, the pianist, was named Mildred Stansted. I spoke with her at the Platinum Slipper, which was in a basement not far away in Stanhope Gate. Slinger Woods had accompanied me. No, sir, I don't think I have any idea who could have done it. Of course, I'm not as close to my sister as I was before Stan and I were Mr. married. Mr. Stansted, your husband? Stan, yes. He's a drummer. I haven't seen him in two months. He's at the Royal Casino in Brighton. You've been alone since then? Yes. Why didn't your sister come to live with you? Well, we never knew when Stan would be back in London. And then Rowena would have to look for other quarters, and she was quite comfortable over... Well, all in all, it was better for her. Why? Well, she could meet her own friends. Did you know any of those friends? Yes, a few. Harriet Abrams. Uh, Lily Yates. Mm, Lily Yates, the singer at Barney's. Margot Evans. The girl that was married to Kenneth Ogilvy, it's Slinger. Polly Green. Uh, Polly Green. Claire Sutton. That's about all. Men friends, I mean. She hadn't any men friends. Me? Oh, yes, you. And Herman Forster. <laughs> Herman always says he's in love with Rowena. You know, Slinger. I wonder if he knows about... How would he know? Rowena hasn't seen him for... He's a big, fat man with pimples on his face. Face trombone. She never sees him. She did see you, though. Me? Yes, occasionally. Well, I was working with her. I, I used to take her home nights. You're working with me too, Slinger. You never took me home. <laughs> Afraid of Stan. Stan, six foot one. Too big for me. You're safe, Mildred. Nobody else? Nobody else what? Friends of your sister. She didn't have many friends. No. You were her closest friend, Slinger. We were close friends. 
Poor Rowena. You were the last one to see her alive, Slinger. No, I wasn't. Why, who was then? Well, the, the bloke that murdered her, obviously. Let's start over again, I said. It was obviously someone she knew quite well who had killed Rubina Hargard. How do you know? I just like to use the word, friend Woods. But elementary. Why? I think you're right. Why? Was your sister... I beg your pardon, Mrs. Stansted, but please tell me the truth. Now sit still, Mr. Woods. Was your sister in the habit of admitting strange men to her room alone at night? But she was she not. She was not. Excuse me. I know you have the highest respect for your sister. And so have I. Oh, forgive me. There was obviously another man in her room when she was killed. Why not another woman, Inspector? Let's say another person. Where were you last night, Mrs. Stansted? At home, in my flat. I don't suppose you could prove that. I didn't murder my own sister. Nor did I accuse you, madam. I merely asked if you could prove that you were at home. I was at home. My daughter was there with me. Did anyone else see you? Well, I don't know. How old is your daughter, Mrs. Stansted? She's three. Her evidence is inadmissible. Mr. Woods, you admit you were there. Hmm. She was alive when I left. So you say. Can anyone else testify to that, sir? Well, if... nobody saw me leave except Rowena herself. She could... Rowena is dead. Have you been on good terms with your sister, Mrs. Stansted? Uh, yes, of course. That you can prove. Well, of course I can. I, yes. Uh, now, Mr. Woods. Yes, sir? You were on good terms with the deceased? Certainly. I testify to that. You may have to testify on your own behalf, Mrs. Stansted. Well, I tell you, Excuse I... Excuse me again, please. These other persons you mentioned as acquaintances of your, your sister... I'm as sure of those other women as... As you are of yourself, Mrs. Stansted? Why do you persist in accusing me? I wouldn't kill my sister. Let's say for the moment we have eliminated you two. And the other women acquaintances of your sister. Now the others. Well, what about the people that live in that building? The, the other tenants of the building? We'll get to them if there's any cause to suspect them, Mr. Woods. The ones we have talked about. Wasn't there a... Fat man with pimples who, who plays the trombone. Uh, uh, Herman Foster. Why, well, he was in love with Rowena. Oh, she wouldn't look at the blighter. Nobody would look at Herman Foster. He's so silly. He's played the trombone too long. And those pimples. He stutters. And he drinks gin, he drinks. Your husband drinks gin. My husband's in Brighton. Didn't your husband like your sister, Mrs. Stansted? <laughs> he, 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 he liked her a great deal, I thought. Don't stutter, darling. I don't stutter. When he's excited, he does. Just like Herman Forster. Well, anyway, Rowena likes me. I suggest we're getting right off the subject. What? Well, uh, Aren't uh, we? Well... All we want to know is who killed Rowena. Well, by an amazing coincidence, that is what I want to know. And when I find him... You propose to see him hanged, I do, says. and I shall. Is there somebody in the bar yet, Slinger? Huh? Is the bar open? I want a drink to that. Well, I think Gregory... Well, what are you going to be drinking, Mildred? I thought you were a teetotaler. Both Rowena and I, as you jolly well know, Slinger. Well, I'm not, by any manner of means. As I jolly well know. Well, I hope you forgive me, but I'm a teetotaler too. The stuff makes me violently ill. I wonder if they've got sarsaparilla. Quick. Well, I'll have a little sarsaparilla. Two sarsaparillas, Gregory. What'll you have, Slinger? Uh, gin and Angus Chola, Gregory, please. Gin. That's what Stan always drinks. Stan? My husband. When he does drink... Herman Foster drinks gin neat, pig. He does drink good gin, I will say that. Booths. Same as Stan drinks. I don't know one from another. N neither do I, Inspector. Oh, there you are, Gregory. Yes, Mum. Sarsaparilla for you, Mum. Pink gin for you, sir. And sarsaparilla for the other gentleman. 
Sure. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Well, confusion to murderers. Death to Rowena's murderer. Drink up, Slinger. I sloshed a little as I walked down the street to the building where Rowena had lived. The body had been taken to the mortuary in Horse Ferry Road, and the man who remained, Sergeant Fraser, told me a strange tale. I suppose I'd better begin at the beginning, sir, eh? I know of no better place, Sergeant. Right, sir. There were fingerprints on that clarinet. Well, if there'd been footprints, I would have resigned. No, sir. Fingerprints. Whose? Oh, <laughs> you wouldn't know, of course. No, sir. Not till we checked with the files or something, but there was only one set of prints. Sure of that? Yes, sir. One set, one person. Then? The knife, sir, that she was stabbed with. Yes. Here it is. I mean, this is the photograph that Tommy McDermott made. A print, I mean. He developed it and somebody took it back to the laboratory and made a print. I'm familiar with certain photographic processes. Yes, sir. This is the print they brought back here for you. Yes. It's a plain table knife, sir, as you see. Yes. Of a type used by many restaurants, sir. I've seen the knife itself. Yes, sir. But perhaps you might have failed to notice this. What? This inscription stamped on it. I can read. Oh, I can't read Greek. Hey, if you'll allow me, sir. Alpha Rho Tau Epsilon Mu Iota Sigma. Artemis. I say, you read Greek, Sergeant. I am a Greek, sir. This is obviously the name of the restaurant. Artemis was a well-known Greek goddess. The goddess of the chase. As the Damn. Romans knew her, sir. There are 34 Artemis restaurants in London, sir. Oh. One of them very close to this place, sir, in Stanhope Gate, next door but one to the Platinum Slipper. Where Rowena Hargard worked. Come on, let's go. I've been there, sir. The proprietor is a man I know very well, Mr. Christos Beres. The knife came from there. What does he know about it? Nothing at all, sir. Oh. There are no fingerprints on it. Well, the fingerprints on the clarinet are probably Slinger Woods. Yes, sir, we all think so. It can be compared at your convenience, of course, sir. What else? We've questioned all the people in the house, sir. No results, I suppose. No, sir. Well, we'll try it again. Yes, sir, of course. That's all? Well, no, sir, not quite. What else? This, sir. We found this in that corner over there on the carpet under the table. It's no wonder you didn't see it, sir. Yes. What is it? It appears to be a ball of tin foil, sir. In fact, that's just what it is. How do you know? I unrolled it, sir. Anything on it? Fingerprints? No fingerprints, sir. It'd be very hard to lift them. The tin foil's being crumpled, so. Anything else? Yes, sir. Printing, sir. Shall I unroll it for you? I'll do it. Oh, don't tear it. I'm not going to tear it. Sorry, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. You can read it now. Yes. Booth's House of Lords Dried Gin. Gin? Rowena Hoggard didn't drink gin. She didn't drink anything. What's this doing here? Who found it, sir? There, under the... Who found it? I did, sir. On the carpet? Yes, sir. And somebody's been drinking gin here. Yeah. What? <laughs> I said yes, sir, sir. Booth. Lots of people drink booze, sir. She didn't. Mm, no, sir. How do you know? Well, you said she didn't, sir. And the police surgeon who took her to the mortuary telephoned at 510 to say that there was no trace of alcohol in any form in her stomach. So she didn't drink any of this bottle, wherever it is. Yes, sir. Oh, she didn't. Her sister says she doesn't drink. How about the owner of that clarinet, sir? Hmm? Yes, he does. 
Booth gin, too, by George. I look here. Those other chaps do, too. What are other chaps, sir? People who knew Wiener Hargett. Were they here, sir? Well, Woods, who drinks this brand of gin, was here. We know that. He admits it. The other two. Do you know what, Sergeant? What, sir? You said there aren't any other fingerprints. There couldn't have been, could there? I went out and sat down in the flat's tiny kitchen. There was no gin there. Nor any indication that gin had ever been there. There was nothing. The place had been meticulously cleaned up and only a white checkered apron hanging on the wall was left to remind of Rowena Hargett, who lay in a butchery over in Horseferry Road. Vaguely, I heard the telephone jingle, and vaguely, I heard Sergeant Fraser's voice somewhere arguing with someone in an unfamiliar language. A little while later, Fraser came into the kitchen. Sir, he said... Sir? Yes, Sergeant. Sir, I've... Uh, I mean, I've just been onto the telephone. With whom? My friend, Mr. Chris Bell. Who's he? Why, you remember, sir, the proprietor of the Artemis restaurant. Oh, yes. Where the knife came from. A knife. The one the young lady was stabbed with. And what did he have to say? Uh, what did he say? He said he was standing in the bar of the Artemis restaurant late last night when the man bought the bottle of Booth's gin. Huh. Was that the only bottle of Booth's gin he sold last night? It was the only bottle of Booth's gin he sold to a man who had one of the Artemis restaurant's knives in his pocket, sir. What? What do you say? What do you say? What is this about an artist? Now, stop gibbering, man. What are you saying? Uh, excuse me, sir. My tie. I'm sorry. Now, what? <laughs> well, he said a man who had one of his restaurants, and I stuck in his throat, breast pocket, uh, bought a bottle of booze gin from him late last night. Who was he? Did he recognize the man? Could he identify him? <sighs> he said he could identify the man easily if he hears him talk. What's that? What, what's that? What if he hears him talk? Christos said he couldn't be mistaken. The man stuttered. And if he hears... The man him... stuttered. Did the man... Was he carrying a clarinet? No, sir. He didn't say so. No? Well, of course he wouldn't have the clarinet with him. Be here. He forgot it. He kept on forgetting it. Fraser. Quick, you know where Slinger Woods lives? Yes, sir. Go get him. Go get him at once now. Quick. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And fetch him to this Artemis restaurant. I'll meet you there. We'll, we'll get him identified. We'll solve this thing tonight. I should have known nobody could be that clever. Now get going, man. Get going. Fraser raced out after Woods. I rushed to the Artem's restaurant and found Christos Beres. Of course he could identify the man. Of course I can, he said in his curious English, and in came Fraser, dragging a somewhat gin fuddle Slinger Woods. Is that the man? I yelled at Christos Beres. Hello, my friend Slinger. When you are you going to pay me those two pounds, you owe me? You know, I don't see you for two months. Is that the man? I yelled at him again. It's my good friend Slinger Wood. Of course it's not the man. And now I get my two pounds, I hope. Well, uh, 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 I'm a little short just at the moment, uh, Christus. Well, what's the matter? Oh, hello, Inspector. Hey, where are you going? Uh, I owe Chris two pounds. The other two men who drank Booth's gin and who stuttered. One of them was in Brighton. The other... The disgruntled suitor of Rowena Hargard, the fat man with the pimples, the frustrated trombone player whom she never saw anymore. Fraser, do you know where, what's his name there, Herman Foster, the trombone player, lives? I'll find out, sir. He found out. He knew somebody who knew everything. And we went to Herman Foster's address. A huge old house with a rickety stairway leading from the ground floor right from alongside the door to the first floor above. That's his room, sir. Right alongside the top of the stairway. Shall I... Herman? Herman Foster? Herman? 
And at the third call, an enormous man with a red blotched face stopped out at the door at the head of the stairs, stared over the rail down at us. Herman! Look out! Herman! Dead drunk. Gin. Pick him up, Sergeant. Reeking with gin. Sloppy with it. His eyes tightly shut as we held up. His pimply face beaded with sweat and gin. And look in his shirt pocket, sir. An almost silver table fork. And a spoon... And another bent table knife from the Artemis Cafe, still in his pocket. Take him away, Sergeant. He's not dead. But I rather imagine he will be soon enough. And when he had sobered up enough, Herman Foster, the frustrated trombonist told us how he had brooded once too often over his rebuffs from Rowena Hargett and had taken his bottle of gin and his stolen weapons to her flat and then sat down after she had admitted him and drank three quarters of the gin at one long draught. He swayed a little as I spoke to him the last time, but he remembered just as he remembered the murder. Herman Foster, I arrest you for the willful murder of Rowena Hargett, and I warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. I didn't stutter at all. Neither did the hangman. today on Whitehall 1212, Lester Fletcher as Inspector Bennett. Others in the order of their appearance, Harvey Hayes, Carl Harbord, Isabel Elson, Francois Grimard, and Glenn Farmer. This is Lionel Rico speaking. Whitehall 1212 is written and directed by Willis Cooper. <laughs> Our Defense Department announces that blood banks are almost totally exhausted. This month, for example, the Defense Department is short 300,000 pints of blood. The problem is critical. In one month, blood donation dropped to less than 40,000, 260,000 pints less than are needed. Remember, there is no substitute for blood in the treatment of many battle casualties. Your local Red Cross chapter can direct you to the nearest receiving spot. Volunteer now and save a life.